Um, a lot of you know that growing up, my name was not Tom, uh, but my name was Tombo. And uh, yes, T-O-M-B-O, um, that's okay. Some of you are still trying to figure that out. Um, I'm not, Toddle, be quiet, please. Um, I haven't picked on you the whole service. Don't start picking on me. Um, so uh, we know that, that that was my name growing up. I, I go back home, and sometimes people will say, when I do go back home, some someone will say, now, how do you go? Do you still go by Tombo, or is it Tom, or is it Tommy? Um, and I just tell them Brother Tom, because that's, that's what works for me, right? We all have a past. We have something that we go back to, something, maybe a nickname or two that people called you. But what if you got your nickname because of who you were, your profession? We're going to look this morning at defeat. So let's stand together. Joshua chapter 2, beginning with verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. And Father, we ask this morning that you would give us wisdom as we read the life of one who had a label. But God, you brought her to victory over the label, over the past, over the sin. And so many of us in this room just need to be told that there is victory despite our past. There is hope despite our sin. There's freedom despite our incarceration. There's sobriety despite our drunkenness. God, you bring hope. You bring freedom. And we thank you for this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the Bible's very clear of how people recognized Rahab. It says, so they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Due to her profession, due to her lifestyle, she was labeled. This is who she was. People knew who this woman was. And it was common knowledge. And so she wasn't just Rahab. She, she was the harlot named Rahab. People knew who she was. She was already labeled. Her past, her sin, her lifestyle had allowed people to nickname her, to, to know who she was. And, and so if we're not careful, a lot of times people will walk in the doors and not look like us. They may have things uh, that don't look like what we would have on us. So I, I remember one time somebody, the first time I ever had an old deacon look at me and, and said, I can't believe that that person's in our church. Now, it didn't happen here, but I just at a church. I can't believe that person's in our church. Well, what church should they go to? Where should they be? Well, they just shouldn't be here. They don't look like us. Well, what exactly do we look like? The young man was Caucasian like most of the people in the church. They weren't talking about his skin color. He didn't look like them. I don't even remember what it was. Maybe it was an earring or something else that he had. And they're all. Oh, do you know how sad it is when we look at somebody's appearance and we automatically label them at that moment? What if God were to look at your appearance and realize that what you're trying to hide from everybody else he sees? We put labels on people. Rahab had a label. The church should never label anyone. When they walk in the door, they walk in as either potential for hope or they walk in as changed. But when somebody walks into the church, we don't care what they look like, how they dress, what they, we want them to know there is hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. So Rahab, known as the harlot, but God wasn't through with her. You, you read this with me last week. We know that as we keep reading, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is faith? 
Again, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Folks, when I die, when my last breath is taken, there is not any doubt in my mind that I will be with the Lord at that very moment. I may not have been at Calvary. I may not have seen the blood flow from the cross, but I'm telling you that the very blood that flowed from Jesus Christ, my faith is in that, and it has covered me and washed me white as snow. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. So this is the hall of faith we're reading. Guys, if we were to take as a church, we would not do this. But if we were, and we were to go out and put a big billboard out here outside of the church, and, and we wanted everybody that drove by to know about the men and the women at our church, would your name be able to go up on that billboard? Would we be able to tell people of the great faith that you have? Because I've got news for you. You have people watching you. People are wanting to be just like you. The three men who play instruments on this stage, they all have little children. Last night, we received a video of Peter's little boy, Anthony. And he's, he wants to be his daddy. He's got the guitar in his hand. And he's a strumming the guitar, singing, Jesus loves me. With all of his might, by the way. He was letting him, he was letting it go. Why? Because that's what his dad does. That's who his father is. And so my question is, can we obtain a good testimony even with our own children? Do they see the faith living within us? You see, verse 31 says something beautiful. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Folks, the Bible's speaking here of her faith. Yes, they mention her as the harlot Rahab. Again, the label was there. But why do they mention it here? Because they want you to know that no matter what your past is, no matter where you're from, God is able to break whatever you've brought to him. There's freedom in this. There's freedom in the good news of Jesus Christ, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be any sort of sin, it doesn't matter. You bring it to God and he has the power. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. In other words, by faith, this woman known as Rahab, known as harlot, put her faith in God. And while all others had turned their back on the Lord, she and all those in her house were the only ones to survive when Jericho was destroyed. Why? Because she showed faith. How did she show faith? She received the spies that were sent over to look at the land. And she had fear in God. And all of that to bring us to this, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Matthew 5, verses 1 through 6, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now remember, we're talking about the harlot Rahab. We're talking about a woman who would not have had much respect uh, anywhere. She was known this. This is not a good name. This is a very derogatory name that was given to her. But I want you to pay attention and see what actually takes place. God took a woman like this and did something amazing. It says that Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. By, t- by the way, Tamar, that's a really sad situation. Go back and read it in your, in your Bible. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nishan, and Nishan begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by who? Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. God used a woman who would have had no respect, nothing with the people, and he brought forth this great king who, by the way, Jesus himself comes from this line. Is that not awesome? You see, Rahab left her sinful ways and followed after the one true God. She recognized her need 
for God. She was a religious person. She understood about the gods. They served one there and within Jericho, the, the moon goddess they had served. So she understood about religion, but religion was not what she needed. I have met many people who have gotten into a lot of trouble, and immediately, the, one, the moment they got into trouble, they found religion, but they didn't find Jesus. The reason you see so many people get in trouble, when I go in and speak to people in the jail, I tell them, I don't want you to have religion. I want you to find Christ. Why? Because if they get religion, they can lose religion very quickly. But my friend, once you get Jesus, you don't lose Jesus. She understood. I've got to leave these sinful ways and follow after the one true God. She went from being a harlot to being considered one of the most faithful in all of Scripture. Could you imagine? Have you read the names in this particular passage in the, in the halls of faith? Have you read this in Hebrews 11? Have you read the great names like Abraham and Isaac and Moses and all of these men, Gideon and the like, all of these? And then there's this woman who has a sinful, terrible past. And God says, by the way, I include her. You see, she did not let her sin defeat her. She did not let her sin defeat her. A lot of people are labeled. She was labeled. She didn't allow her label to be what made her life or end her life or give her success or not give her success. Instead, it was God who gave her victory. She did not let her sin defeat her. So many of us think that I can never be used of God. I have, I have done something that has disqualified me from something in, within the kingdom. I, I can't do this. Can, so God's not going to be able to use me anymore. No, no, no. Listen to me. God can take, as Toddle has taught me since I have known him, God can take a test and turn it into a testimony. Whatever you have in your life, look at it as a test. And quit flunking. <laughs> How many of you have ever taken a test knowing you were going in, you were not going to pass the test? But what did you do? Be honest. What did you do just before you took the test? Dear Lord God. <laughs> Lord, please. Don't ever, if you didn't study, don't ever pray for God to give you good rec, you know, recollection of what you study because you didn't study. Pray for a miracle. Right? Anybody ever taken one of those Scantron tests and you just went down and you went A, A, B, A, B, C, A, B, B, <laughs> trying to go down a deal and you're just rolling the dice at the end of, oh, that was a Vegas, I'm Baptist, I forgot about that, I'm sorry. But anyway, you're doing all these different things and it's just crazy, it's insane and you're trying to figure, how am I, Rahab said, listen, I know that I've, I've, I've failed every test up to now, but now God, I believe in this one who is real, who is true, who is good and he will not let me fail the test this time. You see, the reason that we keep failing is because we're not relying upon God. We're relying upon religion and ourselves. We've got to come to God. We need to come to God through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sin. Aren't you glad you don't have to depend upon me for your salvation? It would be scary if you depend upon me for your salvation because I am no good. Just the reality of it. But God is so good. So good. You see, the only way for us to have success in faith is to defeat the sin that is in our life. We want to have great faith. We want to really grow in Christ. Then you've got to deal with the reality that you have sin in your life. Where are we at? Let me ask you this question. When you were saved, what did God save you from? Not a bad question, huh? When you were saved, what did God save you from? What was he rescuing you out of? What was he giving you hope for? Whether, no matter what the sin was, no matter what your life was beforehand, when God came to you, he said, listen, we got to get rid of this. We're saving you out of this. And so if we continue to sin after we become believers, our faith is diminished. Our faith is not strong. It's very weak. A lot of preachers stand up and they preach God wants to bless you and give you everything and do this and do that. But they forget to tell you the real truth of God's word. You need more than to be told how good God is. You also have responsibilities. There are things that we need to do and we must do. You see, we, don't, we, we realize this. That faith becomes weak when sin reigns in our lives. We want to get rid of that. And, and 
And we want to deal with the sin that's there because the last thing that I want to do is stand before God knowing that I had the power to overcome sin. And yet when I died, I died in my sin. God has given me the power over this through his blood, through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So we sin against God in a fourfold way. And I want to look at these four things this morning. We sin, in, we sin against God in a fourfold way. First of all, we sin or we can't remain in an ungodly identity. We can't remain in, in an ungodly identity. Here's the problem. We have people that walk the aisle. They, they want to come down. They want to shake the pastor's hand. They, they're having a rough time in life, and they want, to, they want to find Jesus. So what they find is religion and nothing changes. For a believer, we cannot continue with an ungodly identity. Things must change. Things have to change. Sanctification is the process. It's you and I aren't understanding that sanctification is something that must take place in our life. We cannot remain with this same old past. People should know you new and different. Let's look at what 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 20 says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Let me read this again so we'll all get it. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, you know, Brother Tom, I prayed a prayer. I I got saved when I was a kid or I got saved when I was a teenager and I did all those things and so I'm good. Really? Do we understand what salvation is? Salvation isn't just a free ticket to heaven. Salvation is life-changing. So we need to understand, even those of us in the church, we need to check ourselves against these things. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. He's telling you, pay attention. Just because you might remember, he's writing to the people in the church. And he's telling them, listen, you need to pay attention. Don't be deceived by this. He says, here's how it works. Neither fornicators, and there's all types of fornication, nor idolaters. There's all types of idols, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. A lot of you are like, well, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good on that. That list doesn't affect me at all. How many of you have ever wanted something that somebody else had? Like you look over at it and you're like, I really like what my neighbor's got. A lot. I kind of like that. I wonder if when he dies, he'd be willing to like give that to me. That's covetous. I wonder if maybe they were to lose it. Going down the highway. Maybe it's something you want that fell out of their car. Would it be okay to pick up and bring home? I mean, he's not, he's not going to know who's got it. We covet things. We lie. Within the church, there's drunkards, revilers. I've been to enough uh, business meetings to know that. Extortioners. And what does it say? None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. But listen to what this next verse says. This next verse is the key to this whole thing today. This next verse is very powerful. Verse 11 says, and such were some of you. Paul is saying, hey, that's the lifestyle you used to be in. That's why when sinners walk in the door, we should be the most welcoming place because we were those people. (laughs) We were those people. You say, well, how, do we, how, how can you say that? What do you mean we were those people? Well, let's see what he says. And such were some of you. In other words, at the church in Corinth, what did they have? They had fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. And they were all headed to hell, he says. But no, you are no longer those people. Something happened. Something's changed. He says, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the spirit of, of, God, of our God. Glorify God then in body and spirit. This is important that we understand this. All things are lawful for me, he says, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful. Sure, you want to go drink? That's up to you. But, but let me ask you this question. When we drink, when we cuss, when we do those things out in public, let me ask you this question. Really, I want you to listen. 
What does it say about your witness? Paul was saying, my witness is more important than my physical desires. My witness is more important than my physical desires. He says, I can go do any of those things. It's lawful for me. But if somebody sees me doing something that they would see as unrighteous or unholy, then I have messed up my witness with them. All things are lawful for me, but, not, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Well, I can drink a little bit. It's no big deal. Some of you know you can't because every time you do, you mess up. Sin is there, folks. Sin is right there. Food for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. When you become a Christian, you're not to stay in your sin. You're to be raised up out of that life. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, salvation has brought you from death to life. Live as though you are a living, breathing Christian. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? You, you know how this works, don't you? Men, you wind up looking at some girl, and the next thing you know, you're, 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 you've got thoughts going in your head. You look at a lady over there. Wow, look at her. Ladies, remember this. Be mindful of how you dress. Be mindful of how you dress. Men, be mindful of how we look. Read again. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? Certainly not. Women at church and when they're outside of the church should dress differently than the women of the rest of the world. Men in the church, when you're in the church and you're outside the church, we should be looking at people differently than the rest of the world looks. He says, certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Some interesting statistics that I found while we were, at, uh, we were in Kentucky. A lot of the older people that are here, you grew up in a generation where about 72% of your generation went to church. So if you're in your 70s and 80s, about 72% of your generation went to church. The next generation was about 60%, and it dropped off to about 50 Our current rate with our teenagers, some of you look at teenagers like, oh, they got that long hair. Look at how they dress. Look at the music they listen to. Folks, 18% of their generation goes to church. 18%. Next time you get a chance to hug a youth, hug them. Tell them how thankful you are. Pinch your little cheeks. They love that. Make them feel really welcome. These kids need to know we are glad you are here. Amen. They need to know that. They need to see it. Men and women struggle with sexual morality. Statistics were given. 25% of women struggle with some sort of online. You, I won't say it, but you figure out the rest of it. 96% of men. They surveyed thousands of people put out by the Pew Research. Folks, we're living in a generation. We're living at a time where it seems as though the world has gotten more ungodly. The truth is the church has just begun to shrink. And we are seeing the evidence of it because the church has gotten a lot less evangelical. A 
We're to flee these things. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? Let me ask you this question. If, if what you have done in the past six months, could we put it up here and let everybody see? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. What are you supposed to be doing on this earth? Glorifying God. Working for him, working for the kingdom. Number two, our minds need to be transformed. Our minds need to be transformed. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We sin with our minds. How many of you have ever had a great day? I mean, you were really trying hard to be faithful. Man, that was your, like, I just want to do good today. I want to do everything I possibly can. And all of a sudden, at the end of the day, boom, something pops in your mind, and you don't even have a clue where it came from. One of our biggest battles in life is here in our mind. That's why we have to stuff our mind with the gospel, with, with God. We have to focus on the word of God, look at what God has to say to us, put it within us that we might not, what? Sin against him. We have to take captive or be taken captive. Those are your choices. We either take captive the thoughts that are there or we're taken captive by them. You ever had a thought come in your head and you knew immediately you had to get it out? That's good. That's the Holy Spirit at work. But how many of you have ever had a, mind, had a thought that you know wasn't supposed to be there, but you thought, yeah, I might think on that for a little while. I might think on that one. We have to transform our mind. Take those thoughts captive. Give them to God. Number three is ungodly desires. A lot of us in this room, we've never murdered anybody. But let's be honest, during this wonderful pandemic, how many of you have thought about killing your spouse at least once or twice? Right? You know, I mean, it's kind of like, figure something out. Figure it out. He didn't see. Yeah, I, I know. It's kind of... <laughs> it, it's t yeah, it's tough. And so let, me, let, me, let me ask you this question. You ready for this? Ungodly desires. Not just the physical thing, but the very desire. Let's look at this. Matthew 5, 27 through 30 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. And a lot of you are like, I've got that one down. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In this room, there are adulterers. Maybe not in the physical sense. But if we have looked at someone else lustfully, then adultery has been committed. These are things we can't laugh at, we can't joke about. God is very serious about this. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and what? Cast it from you. We'll get to that in just a moment. For it is more profitable for you than one of your members to perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and what? Cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Y'all remember, I don't know if you do or not, but, but when I was growing up as a teenager, there were some new things they were doing. They were, they were telling you, all right, you need to write all of your sin down that you've done and write all these things down and put them in a notebook and then throw them in a fire and burn them up, and that represents a new life, right? Anybody ever going to sift through the, the ambers? You ever gone back and sifted through the, the pages? That you tried to burn up. You ever thrown something away and regretted throwing it away? What happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? She turned into it's kind of crazy stuff, isn't it? it? It's important for us that when we cut it off, when we pluck it out, we don't get to hold on to it. How many of us would try to do surgery on ourselves? I'm going to cut off my hand. I'm going to keep it with me just in case I ever need to use it again. If I ever desire that sinful life, one more time, I'm going to need that hand. I'm going to need that eye. What's the Bible say? He says, pluck it, cut it, and what? Cast it. Get it completely out of your life. Some of you are looking at your spouse right now. 
you got to go. <laughs> it's not how that works. <laughs> it's not how that works. Pandemic's been hard on a lot of y'all, I'm telling you. It's tough. Ungodly desires. It's just the things that we began to look at and we began to want and we began to desire. It starts maybe with the covetous and we just keep looking at it until finally we have sinned in our own minds. And Jesus says, you then are an adulterer. You then are a coveter. The, the things that we've done with our own minds. And some of you are like, well, how in the world are we supposed to win this battle? Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Fill your mind with the gospel. Fill your mind with the good news. How about actions and words? It's another way we sin against God is our actions and words. Just the things that we do and the things that we say. Anybody uh, <clears throat> during this pandemic time and you kind of got, you know, some rough days going ahead. Every day you've, you've gone to bed with this thought and these words on your lips. Praise God for such a beautiful day. How many of you have had some really hard times during the pandemic? Whatever they want to call a pandemic. I'm still trying to figure that part out. I'm trying to figure out the rules of what that means. But uh, during COVID, we've had all these crazy ideas. And, and all of a sudden, how many of you have found your, you don't have to raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. But how many of you have found yourself saying things that you had forgotten how to say? Anger has come up. Words are flying out of your mouth that you know you shouldn't be saying. But it's what's in your heart. And what's in your heart is what comes out of your mouth. What's, what comes out and you, and you act out the things that are in your heart. The Bible is very clear about this. Let me go back and read to you 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Again, he's talking to the church. Pay attention. He says, pay attention when I'm fixing to list to you because this is where you were supposed to have been, but now some of you are revisiting these things. He says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor sorcerers will inherit the kingdom of God. There's another list in the New Testament that adds liars. We sin against God in these four different ways, and we've got to fix this. You see, we are all made in the image of God, every one of us, even the lost, even the people on death row, even those that are the most guilty of, of, of horrible and heinous crimes, they're still made in the image of God. Every single little bitty baby inside a mother's womb is made in the image of God. But to inherit the kingdom of God, we need to be changed into the image of Christ, and the only way that happens is through salvation. Coming to Christ. That's a process called sanctification. You see, our goal is not staying away from sin. How many of you, if I could just, today, I'm, I'm going to do my best to not sin today. Like, that's my goal for today is not to sin. I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to scream. I'm not going to cuss. I'm not going to covet anybody's stuff. I'm, 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 I'm going to be a good person today. I'm not, I'm not going to sin. Well, instead, our goal is sanctification through the power of the Holy Spirit and the act of obedience. You say, well, isn't that what sanctification is? If that's what you've been taught sanctification is, then I feel sorry for whoever taught you that. Sanctification is not you staying away from things. Sanctification is you becoming like Christ. Sanctification is a process of <clears throat> holiness here on the earth, <clears throat> desiring that, seeking that above all things. You and I must come to that place where we understand we're made in the image of God, but we need to be changed into the image of Christ, not just staying away from sin, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we may do what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Folks, we're in desperate need of change. Brother Tom, what does that mean? How do we get there? Rahab obviously found the change. Added to the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Brother Tom, how do we get there? Well, let me read these to you real quickly and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of the, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Are you being changed? Are you being transformed? 1 Corinthians 11 one says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. 
How many, how many dads? Just real quick, raise your hand if you're a father in here. Good. How many of you are a father of little kids? Raise your hand real quick. Good. There's some of you on here. Listen to me, especially those of you that have little children. They want to be just like you. They want to be just like you. Can you be like Paul and tell the church, tell your little kids like he told the church, listen, just imitate me like I'm imitating Christ. Because I've got news for you. If you come to church and you act like you love God and you yet live like a sinner when you leave here, that's what your kids think loving God is. Playing church on Sunday, living like hell the rest of the week. Your kids are paying attention. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Is that working in you? Ephesians 4, 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. 2 Peter 3, 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Does your grace, does your knowledge, are we there? Do we understand who God was or who God is and who Jesus is? Do we understand those things? Are we able to explain those things? That's part of being sanctified, growing in truth. So many people tell me all the time, I just can't teach. Folks, if you are in Christ... You have abilities that you've never had before. That's part of being born again. You've got a new spirit full of power. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Again, why are we here? To do and to will. He's doing that in us. We want to bring pleasure to God by doing what he's called us to do. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2 says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I have delivered them to you. Paul says, I recognize in your life that you're continuing in the faith. Romans 8, 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Don't tell me that you're saved and nothing has happened. Some of you, just like I have, we used to call them backsliders. Y'all remember those? Those of you that are old Baptists, remember that phrase, backslider. There goes a backslider. Nothing felt better to a teenager than hearing that from an old deacon. Goes a backslider. Some of you are in that stage of your life where you're, you've got choices to make. If you truly belong to God, cry out to him. Have him save you from the mess you're about to put yourself into. Anybody in here ever put themselves in a mess? Yeah. Anybody ever tried to blame somebody else for the mess they created? Hey, good, I'm not the only one. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. As you are sanctified, your friends list should be smaller. The people that you hang around, the people that truly have stuff to do with you, should grow smaller and smaller. And a lot of you are trying to make it bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're missing the whole point. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Why are you here? For him. I, Christian posts crack me up sometimes. and they, they, We just sometimes have to be who we are. Well, if that's outside of who God made you to be, that's wrong. That's wrong. You are not yours. You are his. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I love this. My, one of my favorite Bible verses. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things have what? Passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. Some of you are in this room. You're going, I have nothing to offer God. Guess what? He's got something to offer you. You get to trade those old filthy rags for beautiful, beautiful garments of spotless white. 
Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Folks, Christ's very spirit that was within him lives within us if we're born again. Are we going to be perfect? Negative. Negative. We all are going to face different sins throughout our life. Y'all know that? When you're a teenager and a young adult, a lot of your sins are basically the same, believe it or not. A lot of people say, when I, well, I just can't wait to get out of the house. Why? Wait till you get on, get on to college, figure that out then. But right now, as a teenager, be thankful you've got a house to, to have and somebody to tell you what to do. I know a lot of kids that went out on their own early and they wound up in a whole lot of trouble because they thought they were smarter than their parents. We have to be very careful, understanding that we're all going to struggle. Older people may not struggle with the same sins they once did, but they struggle with pride. They hate ask, asking people to help them. They hate asking people to help them, and that's one of the needs that older people have. Don't be ashamed to ask. Don't let pride get in the way. You've never dealt with pride before. Why deal with pride now that you're older? Depression. It's reality, folks. Things begin to happen. We're all, every phase of life, you're going to deal with something. That's why now as a young person, start trusting in God above all things so that when you're older, you know you can turn to God even as you get older. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and we're going to close with this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I don't know about you, but I got work to do. God's done his part. Now I got to do mine. Pray for your pastor to have good obedience. Pray for your pastor to not resemble the old life any longer. I've got a new identity. But if I stick with some of the old things of my old days and my old ways, shame on me. I've got to watch how I speak. I've got to watch what I do. I've got to watch what I look at. What I listen to. What I want. We are desperate. Desperate for Christ. Quit trying not to sin. And start seeking righteousness. Start seeking holiness. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the work of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I feel like oftentimes, even as a pastor, as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, I have trampled upon the grace that you've given me. The very grace that was meant to change me, I've used it as an excuse to sin. And Paul was very clear, we don't want to do that. Lord God, I'm asking you today to change us, each person in this room, individually, change our families. God, change our church. And whoever walks in this door, no matter what they look like, how they dress, where they're from, may we, may we see them as the potential for Christ. May we see them as someone who's already found Christ. Let us all recognize that we too were sinners. And now we are people of salvation being changed daily into the image of your son. God, thank you. Thank you that you have not quit on us. You have not given up on us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.